Hi, everyone, and welcome to our first panel discussion of the day. I'm Dr. Ashnut Gurney, psychiatrist at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Associate Vice Chair of Wellness for the Department of Psychiatry, and Assistant Medical Director of Brigham Psychiatric Specialties. And today, we are going to be bringing together renowned academic thought leaders and research pioneers to discuss the state of knowledge and evidence for treatment, why one perspective alone is not enough in addressing depression. By examining four perspectives on our existing frameworks for depression and how they interface with integrative and holistic approaches to treatments, this morning's talks will set the stage for further dialogue. Formulations of depression will be informed by experts speaking on neuroimaging, epigenetic markers, neurocardiac and cultural perspectives. And together, we will contemplate the interconnections among all four formulations and the opportunities as well as limitations for treatment in each area. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. David Silberswig, the Chair of Psychiatry at Brigham Women's Hospital, who will be speaking about brain circuit abnormalities in depression and its treatment. Dr. David Silberswai graduated from Dartmouth College with high honors in philosophy. He studied medicine at Cornell University Medical College, and he is a neurologist and psychiatrist, having trained in both at the New York Presbyterian Hospital, Wheel Cornell Medical Center. His research postdoc was in the emerging field of functional brain imaging research at the Medical Research Council Cyclotron Unit in Hammersmith Hospital, London. Dr. Silberspweig then returned to Cornell to found and direct the Functional Neuroimaging Laboratory with Dr. Emily Stern. He was the founding director of the Division of Neuropsychiatry as well as the founding director of the Neurology Psychiatry Combined Residency Program at Cornell. And there he was the Tobin Cooper Professor of Psychiatry, Professor of Neurology and Neurosciences, Professor in the Program of Physiology, Biophysics and Structural Biology at the Will Graduate School of Medical Centers, Medical Sciences at Cornell University, and was Vice Chairman for Research in the Department of Psychiatry. He is now Chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at Brigham Women's Hospital and Co-Director of Brigham Women's Hospital Center for Neurosciences. He's been an academic dean at Harvard Medical School and is the Stanley Cobb Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He also has an appointment in the Department of Neurology at Brigham Women's Hospital and is an associate faculty member at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. Thank you so much, Dr. Silverswai, for being here today. Thank you, Dr. Nadkarni. It's a real pleasure to speak with all of you about the brain and how the brain and mind come together and how it is that we as human beings have the thoughts and feelings and cognitions that we have and how things go awry when we suffer with depression and what we might do about it. I uh, want to say that I'm involved in a company that is trying to translate this work into utility for drug discovery and possible um, clinical foundations. I won't be speaking about any of that today. What I'll be speaking about is what we're learning in the revolution that has occurred in our field within the last two decades through the technologies such as functional MRI. You've probably seen pretty color pictures uh, of the brain lighting up with this or that, but it's really the numbers behind them that count and the ability all of a sudden in psychiatric disorders that are not characterized by a stroke or a tumor or an infection that you can see uh, on an MRI scan structurally, the ability with functional MRI to be able to understand where activity is originating in the brain, how it relates to mental activity, to correlate those directly is something that has transformed our field and takes advantage of the fact that there are blood flow and oxygenation changes that accompany neuronal activity when certain neurons are active. I like to show these two series of pictures side by side because we as human beings exist in an evolutionary context and we have deep preserved areas of the subcortical parts of the brain and the limbic system that you see 
in the panel on the left that are largely preserved, although there are changes across the phylogenetic spectrum. At the same time, we have massively increased prefrontal cortices and higher order cortices that characterize our ability to think in higher order fashions and to exhibit higher order uh, control. And I love to keep this in mind when considering any disorder, including depression, because depression is everything from sleep, appetite, and sex drive changes that are very basal and uh, primitive, if you will, or primal, and are deep at the level of the subcortex and the hypothalamus, all the way to higher order existential crises and hopelessness that a person might be feeling that need higher order cortices to support those representations. And as physicians, as clinicians, um, as colleagues, as, as uh, caring people, we need to take all of this into account that these disorders are a combination of everything from our basic drives to our higher order cognition. Stress is ubiquitous. Um, we evolved with stress and early life stress can affect our stress system even into adulthood, adulthood and even subsequent generations through epigenetics as is being found. And without going into the details of the stress system, suffice it to say that there are certain key regions of the brain that are involved in the limbic system that feed and paralimbic areas, related uh, areas, emotional areas in the brain that feed down to the hypothalamus, that feed to the pituitary, that feed to organs like the adrenal glands that produce stress hormones like cortisol, which feed back to the brain and can damage the brain. Um, when stress is overwhelming or prolonged, um, the area of the brain called the hippocampus, which is very important, I'll show you in a moment, for memory and cognition, um, cells can actually shrink. Uh, parts of cells and areas uh, where there's a birth of new cells in the brain, which is pretty miraculous, uh, get perturbed. And this is an underlying pathophysiology, if you will, of a number of psychiatric disorders, including depression. So the hippocampus, under conditions of stress, has even subregions within it that, through various pathological mechanisms, end up being disrupted. And when they're disrupted, we have trouble thinking clearly, concentrating, remembering, contextualizing. These are things that are all affected in depression. Another area that's critical that you may have heard about in the limbic system is the amygdala, where you see the black dot or the black circle here, that region of the brain. And that region of the brain is very important for emotional memory, and uh, in particular, but not exclusively, negative emotions and aversive behaviors, fight or flight behaviors, uh, et cetera. And this area has been shown in depression to have abnormal reactivity. It's too active, it's too reactive in depression. And its connections to other areas, especially areas that regulate it, like the prefrontal cortex, the, the sort of dotted circle uh, above it, are, uh, are disrupted, whereas the hippocampus that we just saw gets shrunken in depression and has the result in cognitive changes that we saw. So there's cognitive changes, emotional changes. Another area of the brain, the ventral striatum, uh, within it's called the nucleus accumbens, don't worry about any of these names, is a reward and motivation center for the brain. And it's been found that that center uh, actually and its networks uh, is deficient, particularly with regard to positive and rewarding um, stimuli or things in the world. And this is thought to underlie anhedonia. Depression is not just accentuation of the negative, as we saw, but it's also failure of the positive in our lives, the failure to generate interest or pleasure in things, and the reward system, which normally does that, and which has more of a dopaminergic rather than a serotonergic um, uh, underpinning, is disrupted in the other direction. The networks of the brain are disrupted. These are not just single areas, they talk to each other. And this is a, another study that we did that without going into detail shows that in healthy people, um, emotion is segregated in the brain and its processing from thought and 
uh, and perception and cognition um, and behavior. But in depression, it all bleeds together. So when people say they're seeing the world through blue colored glasses, so to speak, or that the uh, depressed mood pervades everything, colors everything, there, that's literally uh, correct in terms of the neural underpinnings. Another key area of the brain that's been implicated in depression is the subgenual anterior cingulate gyrus in the bottom of the frontal lobe in the middle. Again, don't worry about all these names. And Helen Mayberg and her colleagues have done pioneering work in this area. And this area is very important for automatic emotional behavioral regulation. And this area is hyperactive and, dis, uh, and has abnormal connections in the depressed state and something called deep brain stimulation for refractory depression that doesn't get better with anything else um, has been shown uh, to, when done in this area of the brain, to be helpful for some patients with depression. The brain is never at rest. Uh, and even though we call it the resting state, the idling state of the brain, we're always thinking things, thoughts and feelings are coming up. And it's been shown that key networks in the brain that fire together in the red on the top is this sort of resting network where we're self-reflective. Uh, in the middle, the central executive network, higher order, uh, voluntary um, executive control circuits in the brain in the blue. And then in yellow below that, the salience network that detects when something's meaningful to us as organisms. These are all important. Our brain switches back and forth and has different interactions among these and other networks. And those have shown to be, uh, been shown to be disruptive in depression with the default mode being hyperactive, especially the front part of it, uh, which is correlated with and underlies the sort of self-absorption uh, and rumination that people with depression have. Um, when, when one does fancy analytics, one can start to see how the patterns within and across these networks actually are disrupted in specific domains or sub-symptoms of depression or subcategories, whether it's disrupted cognitive control, anhedonia, rumination, dysphoria, each of which has a distinct pattern of abnormality with the circuits that underlie those functions and a biased processing uh, that a person can't switch out of. And whole uh, through lots of different sources of information, we now have whole brain maps. Uh, and this is work by Sean Siddiqui in our department uh, that actually are convergent in terms of the neurobiology of depression. And they specify where uh, you can stimulate for something like transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS, which is a non-invasive way of delivering magnetic pulses over the brain. And uh, Sean has shown that you can use image-guided maps in individual people, personalized medicine, just like in starting to be like in cancer and heart disease, that shows where their particular profile abnormalities are that are associated with their particular symptom improvements whether that's anxiosomatic symptoms of depression or otherwise. Um, and uh, that's something that is very exciting and current. We also have the ability to see how these networks are affected uh, and normalized by antidepressant medication, like an SSRI, serotonin-specific reuptake inhibitor, and even develop predictors of that so that we don't have to wait, hopefully, for four to six weeks to see if a person is going to respond. Uh, in fact, one of the most exciting areas now is with intravenous or intranasal ketamine in select patients who are not responsive to other things that works by NMDA receptors, a glutamate excitatory receptor uh, blockade in the brain and other mechanisms that can even reverse suicidality within an hour or hours, uh, which is a game changer. Psychedelics you may have heard about uh, as being uh, utilized. And there's just a paper in the New England Journal this past week, again, on that after one dose in patients with depression, although it's still an evolving area. And these have been shown to change the connectivity within and across networks in a direction uh, that is conducive to healing uh, based upon the circuit abnormalities we discussed. Cognitive behavioral therapy, 
is something that itself engages the prefrontal cortices that you see here in a slice of the brain uh, to downregulate the emotional limbic systems. And we are training our brain in order to be able to control itself better. Mindfulness does the same thing. Uh, and we are able to train our brain to be able, and our mind to be able to uh, achieve more self-awareness and distance, metacognition, attentional control, and emotional modulation. So depressions associated with specific frontal limbic subcortical brain regions and networks that underlie core behavioral, emotional, and thought-related functions that go awry in depression producing specific clinical subtypes and symptoms. Effective treatments range from mindfulness and psychotherapy through medications and brain stimulation, invasive, non-invasive. And these treatments um, correct some of the uh, abnormalities that are seen and normalize the brain network and regional function to provide um, healing for people, hopefully, and brain imaging and this sort of work and this transformation in our field while still taking into account all the rich psychology and psychosocial and sociocultural elements um, is revolutionizing our understanding and hopefully will continue to lead to the improvement of the care that we can uh, deliver to our patients who are suffering so um, poignantly. So uh, Dr. Nart Carney, I would um, send it back to you. Thank you so much for that fantastic overview. Now we are going to have Dr. Olivia Okereke talk about molecular markers in measuring health, well-being, and depression. Dr. Okereke is a board-certified geriatric psychiatrist, an associate professor of psychiatry, and associate professor of epidemiology at Harvard Medical School and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She is director of geriatric psychiatry and director of the Geriatric Psychiatry Clinical and Research Program at Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Okereke's programmatic goals are to identify modifiable risk factors involved in adverse mental aging, and also to translate and apply knowledge gained into strategies for large-scale prevention of late-life depression and cognitive decline. Her research portfolio has been supported by numerous National Institute of Health, University and Foundation Awards. And Dr. Okereke is active in efforts to promote knowledge in geriatric mental health. She regularly provides education on healthy brain aging at community centers, councils on aging, and senior centers around Massachusetts. She has served on both the board of directors and the medical and scientific advisory committee of the Massachusetts, New Hampshire chapter of the Alzheimer's Association has been, and has been a past chair of the chapter's annual meeting. Thank you, Dr. O'Karaki. Thank you so much. Uh, it's delightful to be here and I'll go ahead and get started. So these are some disclosures, funding sources, um, and a book related to late life depression. Uh, so my goals for today are that you would understand um, epigenetic markers that we use to evaluate health and aging, uh, something about the relationship between key molecular markers of aging and behavioral variables such as depression, and then get an understanding of how we can use epigenetics in relation to depression to understand opportunities to improve healthy aging and wellness. So really what this is all about at the end of the day is the fact that we know that we can take these divergent paths in aging. And it's all about finding ways to get on the right path, the path toward healthy aging. Stress and depression are factors that can definitely impact the likelihood of being on one path or the other. They are relevant to aging because depression is a, really a form of chronic stress on the body. And this is something that then can become manifest as accelerated aging, physical aging or cognitive aging. And there are key mechanisms that we can look at to understand how this translates, how stress and depression translate um, to health consequences and chronic disease. The other factor that's important to keep in mind is that depression itself also can alter health behaviors, such as smoking, exercise, and uh, dietary adherence. And these things themselves can in turn impact health. And so stress, depression, and the related modifiable behaviors become potential targets for health and lifestyle interventions. 
So the key molecular uh, mechanisms and markers that are uh, relevant for translation I'll focus on today are telomeres and epigenetic changes. So DNA methylation um, in particular, talk about the epigenome and its relation to downstream ohms. So first off with the telomeres, these are repetitive stretches of DNA. It's a, it's a repetitive sequence of DNA that's reduplicated at the ends of chromosomes they form a protective region, a protective capping at the ends of chromosomes to help maintain the integrity of genetic information during repeated cell replication, thereby promoting genomic stability. And they do progressively shorten over time with accumulated cell divisions over the course of life. And therefore, telomeres are thought of often as a mitotic clock of biological aging. And although, of course, telomere attrition is something that is progressive with the course of the lifespan with age, there are factors, external factors, um, that can tend to accelerate telomere attrition further. And these include depression has been associated with this, inflammation, oxidative stress, and behavioral factors like smoking. So with regard to psychological factors, a uh, number have been addressed with regard to telomere shortening. This is one example from work we did in a large sample of nurse health study participants showing that high anxiety was significantly associated with telomere shortening. And in other work uh, by other groups, uh, Naomi Simon um, and others have uh, own Walkwitz have shown factors such as depression, uh, perceived stress, caregiving burden um, are associated with telomere shortening. However, most of the studies have been cross-sectional analyses, and we undertook in a, a smaller subset of their health study participants studies to look at prospectively, can you observe change in telomere length um, versus repeated measures over time? In this study, we looked at, we had about 100 depression cases and, um, and then the controls, and we found that, although it was not statistically significant um, due to uh, some low power um, based on number of cases, there was, regardless of the telomere change metric that we computed, about a 50% worse shift in terms of telomere shortening over time. And these were measures of telomere length across 11 years. With regard to those behavioral factors I alluded to earlier, we know that things like smoking behavior, physical activity are influenced by depression. People may be more likely to smoke or have difficulty quitting smoking, less likely to exercise. And we observed in a different sample of individuals, a diverse cohort of older adults, midlife and older adults who were part of a national trial, that physical activity in the whole sample was associated with longer telomeres, and there was a significant linear trend. By contrast, we saw that higher levels of smoking, as measured by cigarette smoking pack years, was associated with shorter telomeres. Um, and there was also a significant trend there. But what was interesting also to address is because this was a very diverse sample enriched for um, participants with um, uh, uh, race and ethnicity, um, we were able to look at differences in these subgroups. And we identified that, first of all, women had a much stronger association between smoking and telomere shortening compared to men. This was a strong statistically significant key interaction. And it shows that the penalty uh, if you were sort of co to compare this to years of aging of heavy smoking in women is about 68 years greater than in men. And we particularly noticed this among uh, Black women. And uh, this was something we, we were very interested specifically in this kind of intersectionality. Now, when we look at, again, the idea of epigenetic change, it's important to think about, well, where does this fit in in terms of understanding the link to depression? This is a wonderful model that's been put together by the Morgan Levine group. Um, the paper citation is on the slide. Um, this slide, however, is just my attempt to sort of illustrate some of the concepts she describes in this, uh, this longer paper. The idea is that we look at genetic DNA level factors, the DNA methylome, epigenetic changes, telomere attrition, genomic instability that results. These are DNA level changes. Downstream from there are these other ohms where we look at metabolites, proteins, gene transcripts. And these relate to intracellular changes like mitochondrial dysfunction, lipid dysregulation, changes in cellular senescence or difficulty loss of proteostasis. And these then translate to further down the line, cell and cell systems, particularly in the central nervous system, where we can observe things like 
changes in immune function, reduced uh, neurogenesis, that was something Dr. Schilberswag referred to earlier, and clinical metabolic changes. Then the next level of what we can observe in terms of downstream consequences would be at the level of the whole brain neuroimaging, looking at changes in circuits, uh, atrophy, changes in vascular function. And then finally, we have a clinical uh, outcome that we can observe, which is depression, for example. We observe mood changes, cognitive and other functional changes. So there's a really nice hierarchical way that Levine and colleagues really use to link epigenetic all the way down to something like depression. It's very elegant. In terms of epigenetic aging, the utility of um, epigenetics has also been shown in terms of looking at these clocks of aging. You can derive from DNA methylation site um, or site methylation um, along CPGs, as we call them. There are hundreds of thousands of lungs in the genome, but it turns out that only a few hundred of them are necessary, a hundred of these CPGs to calculate DNA methylation age. Horvath, Hannum, and colleagues earlier computed indices that have extremely high correlations with chronological age. Then you can compute something we call age Excel, which is basically an index of the extent to which individuals' um, aging is greater than that expected um, by chronological age. Newer clocks include things like pheno age and grim age, and these are, um, uh, predictors of chronic disease and um, mortality. So with regard to um, these markers of epigenetic aging, we looked at these again in that diverse cohort of individuals who were in a clinical trial, and we identified, for example, that accelerated aging in um, um, that uh, anxiety, higher levels of anxiety were associated with age excel, with significantly greater epigenetic aging out of proportion relative to chronological age. But by contrast, we saw that psychosocial support was significantly associated with slower epigenetic aging, um, with a, again, strong point estimates of association. And with regard to those correlated lifestyle factors and depression, we look at things like alcohol use, drinking, um, smoking, body mass index, and we see that these are associated positively with older DNA methylation age, with epigenetic aging. By contrast, higher frequency of habitual exercise, as well as intensity of exercise through metabolic equivalent task hours, higher numbers of that inversely associated with epigenetic aging. So just to summarize, we see these really compelling links between bio, uh, biological aging markers, these molecular markers like telomeres, and epigenetic markers, these cutting edge epigenetic markers that help us understand what is the translation between depression, stress, and related lifestyle factors to faster aging and ultimately health consequences. I think important emerging areas include things like looking at variation by key subgroups as we saw, looking at sex differences, looking at differences among racial and ethnic groups where these behavioral factors may also further vary. This has important clinical implications in terms of targeted prevention. And then another area that's emerging and exciting is the whole idea of looking at epigenetic influences across the lifespan and how this relates to depression. So one example may be, for example, epigen stress and epigenetic changes in one generation and then the next generation's risk of depression because of changes in epigenetic marks. Or another example being things such as adverse child experiences and accelerated aging and subsequent risk of depression in individuals across the lifespan. So these are all some of the very um, exciting areas in which we're looking at epigenetics, epigenetic aging, and depression. And um, again, I'm delighted to uh, introduce some of this for you. And Thank you. Thank you, Dr. O'Karaki. Next, we will have Dr. Greg Frischone talk to us about the aching heart, pathways between depression and coronary artery disease. Dr. Frischone is Associate Chief of Psychiatry and Director of the Benson Henry Institute for Mind-Body Medicine mm -hmm as well as director for the Chester Pierce Division of Global Psychiatry. Additionally, Dr. Frischone is the co-director of the McCann Center for Brain Health in the Department of Neurology mm -hmm. at Mass General Hospital 
and the mind-body medicine professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He specializes in neuropsychiatry and psychosomatic medicine, and for 40 years, he has helped care for patients with severe medical, neurological, and surgical illnesses. He has published more than 230 peer-reviewed publications and has authored or co-authored six books. He is also the medical editor of the 2020 Harvard Medical School Special Report on Stress Management. Thank you, Dr. Frischoni, and take it away. Thank you, Dr. Carney. Uh, it really is a, a privilege to be with um, wonderful colleagues on this panel, and I thank the organizers for inviting me. So I do have a, a couple of uh, disclosures, um, uh, but nothing really pertaining to my talk today. We're gonna to review the pathophysiology of stress as a, um, uh, Olivia mentions, depression is really a form of chronic stress. And I wanna highlight the distress of separation as the driver for both um, uh, major adverse cardiac events and for depression. This kind of serves as a link for trying to understand that concept of the aching heart or heartbreak. Uh, the link between major adverse cardiac events and depression. And I wanna suggest the role integrative mind-body approaches may play in uh, brain heart health promotion and illness prevention. As uh, Professor Patel made clear in his keynote, we've seen great strides made in cardiology uh, to reduce um, um, uh, disability adjusted life years, but not so much in depression. And perhaps there are ways for us to understand that and do better. So uh, personally, I've been really privileged to be um, uh, uh, taught by uh, wonderful um, um, psychiatrists, uh, neurologists, and cardiologists. I just want to make mention of that. Um, back when I was um, a resident, um, um, Bernard Lown uh, of the Brigham, wrote a really important article on sudden cardiac death, the major challenge confronting contemporary cardiology. And I remember reading that there are hundreds of thousands of Americans who were dying of sudden cardiac death syndrome. Um, uh, and now we know uh, with the development of um, implantable cardiovascular defibrillators, cardiology has really dampened that scourge. Uh, in my fellowship at MGH, uh, uh, the late uh, Ned Kassim was my mentor. And I remember rotating in the coronary care unit at MGH with wonderful teachers. Dr. DeSanctis was uh, going on rounds with him was uh, such a great uh, educational experience and others like Dolph Hutter and Jeremy Ruskin. So they really got me interested in the connection between the brain and the heart. When I went to Stony Brook, I uh, started to do research with an electrophysiologist, cardiologist, Stephen Blay. This is just when ICDs got started, the first generation. And of course, there are many psychiatric sequelae of having um, these implantable defibrillators, panic phobic syndromes, et cetera. And um, so that was a real education. And then when I was at the Brigham, uh, it was a real major treat to uh, attend conferences that um, Dr. Samuels routinely gave. And of course, you know that he really um, um, became an expert in the brain-heart uh, connection. I refer you to his classic article in circulation from 2007. In fact, in that article, he reminded us of Walter Cannon's work in 1942 on voodoo death. And and um, uh, Cannon thought that uh, uh, death could occur through lasting and intense action of what he called the sympathico adrenal system. Uh, and uh, um, Dr. Silberschweig made mention of that uh, cascade. But Kurt Richter in 1957 uh, focused on an experiment with rodents and showed that um, uh, under conditions of high stress, these rodents were dying bradycardic deaths. Um, so that created a bit of a controversy. And um, Marty Samuels uh, in his uh, article uh, talks about the fact that um, this idea of sympathetic and parasympathetic effects leading to, to cardiac death were not mutually exclusive. 
it might be a timing issue that early events might be dominated by sympathetic overdrive, later events by parasympathetic overdrive, and that cerebral hemispheric autonomic dominance, right being predominantly sympathetic and left parasympathetic may play a role in certain individuals. So that's very interesting. And um, you'll see that when we talk about the acute stress response, that both there are both uh, connections to sympathetic overdrive and parasympathetic overdrive. George Engel reported on, on 160 uh, cases of sudden death from disruptive life events. And I just want to point out that most of them were separation challenges uh, to the person who wound up collapsing from a cardiac event. So we might um, um, infer from that that the brain in the, in the setting of severe separation stress uh, was communicating to the heart that there, there was great danger. I love the fact that, that um, uh, David uh, started out with brain evolution. And one of my teachers was uh, Paul McLean, um, the father of the limbic system. And he always sa said to me that the most painful mammalian condition was separation. And um, um, I think that you see here the connection between what happens when the brain is facing severe separation, anxiety, or threat, uh, and what will happen uh, downstream to the heart. Uh, and we're all mammals. So um, as uh, Jang Pangsup taught us that um, mammals are gonna have a, a, a depression that will, will link up the, the brain and the heart. So here are some pictures um, and it's a little um, review of what you just heard from uh, Dr. Silberswag. But I wanna point out these, these centers um, um, to reiterate what David said. You have your amygdala, your fear conditioning center, your hippocampus, which has an ancient role of being able to inhibit amygdala tone. But thank goodness, uh, through evolution, we have this, this prefrontal cortex, the medial prefrontal cortex in particular, including the very important anterior cingulate. David focused on the anterior cingulate in his talk. And only mammals have an anterior cingulate. And this, of is very, very important for all of neuropsychiatry, and it turns out for cardiology as well. Um, and these centers have the ability, and you see here um, in, in work that comes from Kerry Ressler's lab at McLean, that these areas of the brain will be able to communicate with uh, amygdala, and in, in um, psychology, we call that emotion regulation. Uh, and so the, that ability of medial prefrontal cortex to talk down an aggravated, uh, um, uh, excited uh, amygdala becomes very important for all stress-related non-communicable diseases, including depression. And you see here, not only will it be uh, turning on lateral hypothalamus, uh, locus ceruleus to increase heart rate sympathetically, but it will also affect the dorsal vagal nerve and uh, cause bradycardia and other parasympathetic uh, forms of distress. Um, fight, flight, freeze will be coming from this interrelationship of these three major areas that um, help us deal with uh, stress. And the immune system gets into the act, of course, and that'll become important to the story. But when we think about our therapeutics, whether we're talking about medications or um, psychotherapies, we usually are, are um, strengthening this part of our brain to uh, um, uh, affect these intercalated GABA inhibitory interneurons that have the ability to inhibit the glutamatergic outflow tract from the central amygdala. Now, what do, does this turn out to be in human experience? Again, um, you'll see that most of the, the stressors are uh, um, um, recapitulations of what Holmes and Ray taught us in the life stress unit scale. And uh, eight or nine of the first 11 on their life stress unit, stress unit scale are separation events. Uh, this is evolutionary, right? I mean, um, we have the need for certain attachments as Bowlby and attachment theory taught us. 
We need metabolic energy. We need food. We need um, attachment to um, um, uh, uh, sexual objects for species preservation, attachment to parental and social objects for our survival strategy as mammals. And we humans also need attachment to future uh, objects, future goals. And when we're separated from these attachments, we become very anxious. And depression, in my mind, really is the, the overwhelming sense that we've lost some of these attachments or all of them. And then we start to feel this, this outcome of chronic stress or depression. So this is Marty Samuel's uh, um, figure from his 2007 article. And he talks about sympathetic storm and what will happen in terms of the heart um, um, uh, affects at cardiac receptors, calcium influx, and uh, resulting in EKG changes, free radical release, and uh, again, calcium entry. Um, a lot of uh, physiological adverse effects on the heart that can lead to um, uh, malignant ventricular arrhythmias or complete heart block or um, 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 angina and ischemic heart disease. This is the work of Ahmed Tawakal, um, um, uh, a brilliant uh, cardiologist who is now um, uh, turned into a neuroimager doing PET MRIs on uh, patients who are stressed. And he has this model where um, stress, psychosocial stress will affect that amygdala and cause a hyperactivation that sympathetically will drive bone marrow activation, outflowing uh, um, uh, through myelopoiesis, uh, pro-inflammatory uh, uh, monocytes, macrophages, producing pro-inflammatory cytokines, leading to atherosclerotic inflammation and uh, major adverse cardiac events. And you see here another one of the papers from their, from their uh, uh, group that these MACE um, uh, events, stressors, uh, um, uh, um, accelerated amygdala activation causing these effects. And our hope that interventions, including mind-body interventions, can stall to a certain extent amygdala activity. Now, Takotsubo's is a, uh, um, a very uh, a, a graphic example of these uh, circuits that we've been talking about. And, um, and Ahmed has been looking at a ratio of amygdala activation to medial prefrontal cortical activation using a PET MRI. And I think it's a wonderful model for us as neuropsychiatrists to collaborate with um, um, these cardiologists doing this neuroimaging. Um, and, uh, and so I think we can look forward to research looking at the potential effects of neuropsychiatric treatments in forestalling this cascade that can lead to sudden cardiac death, but also um, uh, uh, more chronic cardiac adverse events like ischemic heart disease. Uh, on the left here, you see, I think, a, a nice graphic uh, that was in the European Heart Journal uh, nine years ago. And it tries to summate what's going on. And, and I, uh, Olivia did an excellent job of reviewing some of these, these uh, factors um, that link up depression and cardiovascular disease, psychosocial factors, demographic factors. Um, biological mechanisms, including um, plasminogen act activator inhibitor one, which I, th I think is going to be an increasing area of study. In the brain, we know that uh, uh, PAI1 um, will reduce the, the production of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is important in the depression story. Uh, in the heart, it is also um, um, doing a variety of things, including pro-inflammation and thrombotic events. So this is a potential link, and uh, Hare and his colleagues point that out. Um, and there are other, of course, um, inflammatory uh, connections between the heart and the brain. Think about uh, uh, C-reactive protein, and uh, uh, upstream in that cascade, 
IL-1 data and, and now IL-6. You know, Paul Ridker at the Brigham is doing studies on, on um, uh, a variety of uh, um, anti-inflammatory agents uh, that block IL-6 in cardiac disease. Uh, and of course, there are, uh, as Olivia mentioned, many um, behavioral mechanisms that link up depression and cardiovascular disease. But down here, you see that separation story. The thing that pains us the most, as Paul McLean taught me, uh, and, uh, and this comes out in the Holmes Ray Life Stress Unit Scale and in um, um, studies of uh, 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 cardiac disease and depression. Uh, um, Olivia mentioned uh, the need for social support. Well, that is, is uh, reflected in uh, uh, this connection between uh, heart disease and, and uh, uh, depression. Here's a slide from Stuart Rosen. Uh, um, David uh, uh, worked at Hammersmith. Um, uh, Stuart Rosen is at Hammersmith in the UK. And what he's pointing out here is that when you have angina, um, you're gonna feel that pain in that medial prefrontal cortex. The paralimbic cortex as Mesalam teaches us. The anterior cingulate cortex, the anterior insula work together in, in providing information uh, that we need to form those attachments. And when we lose them, um, um, it's the center of what Paul McLean called the mammalian behavioral triad. And when our, we as mammals lose those attachments, when we feel that separation pain, the heart knows about it. Uh, and, and so angina pain, the aching heart is truly a brain heart uh, uh, collaboration in a sense. We know this when we look at the neurology of pain. And here we see the, um, this, this is the mid cingulate, the dorsal anterior cingulate. And here's the subgenual anterior cingulate and, and the in-between. And this area is more cognitive. This area is more emotional. George Bush and um, Scott Rausch uh, um, really did a wonderful job with their emotional accounting Stroop test, uh, looking at um, um, uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging to really nail down the fact that the anterior cingulate is where pain resides. This is one of the problems with chronic pain patients, because once you have physical pain, you have, uh, you know, you're on workman's comp for a job related injury, emotional pain will, will, uh, is just a short putt from uh, that physical pain impulse. So it's hard to eradicate. This is important for us with cardiac pain. Think of, of, um, of um, patients who wind up as cardiac cripples with panic attacks and so on. So um, to summarize, to me, the brain evolutionarily speaking is a sensory motor analyzer effector. And because of that, we need close communication between our brains and our hearts because um, um, the heart is going to be able to provide the energy for these four operations, sensing environment, analyzing the incoming data and affecting a motor response. And of course, uh, providing energy for our other organs. So this connection is extraordinarily important. And in integrative medicine, it's probably our best example of um, why integrative medicine, mind-body medicine is so important. And we do know that there's a network of brain regions and we can refer to it as the central autonomic network that maps our internal states and controls the, our autonomic responses and I might say our inflammatory responses in the communication with the heart. Stress to me is what the brain does to itself and the rest of the body when there's a separation challenge and the threat of loss of attachments, which results in ANS and innate immune responses, both centrally and peripherally. And when toxic, this can lead to major adverse cardiac events. Thank this you, Dr. Frischone. Really appreciate that perspective. Yes. And now we're going to transition to an introduction to Dr. Margarita Alagrias presentation, and she will be defining the sociocultural context of depression. Dr. Alagria is the chief of the disparities research unit at Massachusetts General Hospital and the Mongan Institute 
the Harry J. G. Leonard and Lucille F. Sir Leonard Endowed Chair at the Mass General Research Institute and a professor in the departments of medicine and psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. She has spent her career examining how to reduce health disparities for populations of color, immigrants, and linguistic minorities. And she has published over 300 peer-reviewed articles, editorials, interventional training manuals, and several book chapters on topics of service delivery and healthcare, methods for assessing diverse populations, and engagement in treatment and patient activation. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Alegria. Thank you so much for having me. Um, can you see my slides? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking now about defining the sociocultural context of depression. And you'll see that uh, this is really important because how we filter the world, how we think about things really has to do with uh, you know, the sociocultural context of how, how we live, who we are. So I have no conflicts to disclose, and I'll quickly go to explaining the importance of the role of culture. So why does culture matter so much? Well, culture is really how we see things around, how we establish a cultural milieu of a shared sets of beliefs. It really is the filter by which we uh, interpret experience. In our multicultural complex world of today, this is really super important because many, many people that will be coming as clients will have very different assumptions, ways of interactions, values and goals from our own. This complexity is so important in terms of the diversity that we have to address in our clinical interactions. I want to talk about you know, culture because this is really dynamic, first of all. It's multifaceted. Uh, it has so many components that really make it uh, work. When we are expressing our feelings of depression, if you think about it, depression how we interpret it is a socially constructed. How we report it back to the clinician is also socially constructed. When we say some, uh, for example, cultural groups don't talk about feeling blue, that would make no sense to them. So we typically don't spend a lot of time trying to understand the norms, beliefs, routines, and expectations of the diverse cultures that come to a clinical visit. We tend to use more shorthand of looking at pe people based on their accent, their, the way they express themselves, their skin color, and make a lot of attributions very, very fast in the first minute of that interaction rather than going through asking a lot about the culture background of the person. This is a, a very convenient way, but in a certain way, it misses a lot of the influence that people have in how they see their illness. I wanna mention this also from the perspective of immigrants because Immigrants that are coming to this country are having many of them very different experiences of how they, they see their depression, how they report to the clinician their depression. And this is very uh, critical in missing some of the key symptoms that people might have. We also make a lot of, for example, about immigrants about their acculturation and about how this influences their mental health. There are two widely observed patterns that people talk a lot about. One is that foreign nativity is protective. This is what people have called the immigrant paradox. And, and it's interesting that in work that we have done with uh, Ron Kessler and others, we found that this immigrant paradox, although we see it for many groups, you have to really disaggregate it but it's based on thinking that foreign born people are exceeding expectations based on having low socioeconomic position and therefore being more at risk of mental illness. 
The other uh, thing that we see that it's very common to talk about is what we call the acculturation hypothesis. And this is the finding that people have reported on that the more time immigrants spent in the United States or the host country, their health deteriorates over time. And this might be due to how you're changing their cultural or orientation, their norms, their practices, even what they eat. I wanna show you work we did in uh, the 2000s uh, with the National Latino and Asian American study. And what we found here is the immigrant paradox. Yes, we saw it. If you can see here, if you compare the rates, the prevalence rates of US born versus their immigrant counterparts, you see that for Latinos, you can see here 19.8% on depression prevalence compared to 14.8 for the immigrant population. However, when we actually disaggregated by different Latinx groups, we found that only for the Mexicans, we can see this relationship, but not the others. David Takeuchi, who has done this same work with the Asian American uh, sample, finds exactly the same way. You need, to you need to disaggregate by the subgroups because we don't find this uh, immigrant paradox for all groups. One of the things that has been uh, studied more now is this issue about what explains this acculturation hypothesis. And I want to uh, present here uh, a very good uh, you know, schema that was presented by Ward and Gehart, showing that you have to take into account many things if you're trying to understand this. You have to understand the societal context, for example, because we see people live in ethnic dense areas of their same um, grouping, they do better than if they are the minority in a very majority area that's very different from them. But the familial context, how they came, the acculturative stress, stressors that they might have, and this acculturative stressors have to do when individuals experience problems in integrating into their host environment that might come from a mismatch between their cultural values and practices, their language difficulties, and discrimination. For example, we assess acculturative stress here. This is from a study that we did, the Boricua Youth Study, where we looked at, as you can see here, feeling guilty for leaving your family, feeling less respect that you had in your country of origin, having limited contact with family or friends from where you are, having difficulty interacting because of your uh, English language proficiency. So these are examples that you can see. One important issue of why I think acculturative stress is so important is because it really has an effect on our mental health. But another thing that I wanna emphasize is false assumptions that we have that tend to guide our diagnostic formulations and many times are incorrect because we don't spend enough time trying to understand the cultural background of the patient. This is work that uh, we did with uh, Robert Givens, who's a psychometrician at University of Chicago, where we were testing differential item functioning for a very diverse sample. These are only the results for the Latino sample, but I wanted to show you four items or four probes that we take for granted in many of our assessments that fail to discriminate between those with low and high depression. For example, how much have you felt cheerful? How easily did you get tired? I had trouble keeping my mind on what I was doing. These are proofs that really did not, were not able to differentiate in terms of depression. The other thing is what we call measurement invariance. We have been doing work, especially because now in our studies, we include more languages than English and Spanish. We have been working in four languages, including uh, English, Spanish, Mandarin, and Cantonese. And what we see in measurement invariance is that some of the measures that we are using really do not work exactly the same 
for different uh, language groups. <coughs> you can see here, uh, this is measurement invariance for the Hopkins checklist for the depression subscale. And these are four, five items that we found differences in terms of language groups. For example, crying easily was unrelating to the underlying construct of depression in English speakers. On the other hand, non-sexual interest or pleasure was also unrelated to Mandarin and Cantonese speakers. And this has been found before. We're uh, asking about it. It's something that people do not relate and do not uh, express out. Same thing for thoughts of ending your life. Sometimes it didn't provide a good uh, indicator of depression because people didn't feel comfortable, culturally comfortable in revealing uh, their suicidal thoughts. Wearing too much and no interest in things, on the other hand, has what we call scalar invariance, meaning that although English and Spanish speakers are report being more bothered by these symptoms in the last four weeks compared to Mandarin and Cantonese, reporting more of this doesn't mean that they have more severe depression. Similarly, in no interest in things, Mandarin and Cantonese speakers are more bothered by this, but it doesn't mean necessarily the same thing, that it's more severe. So the main takeaways from this talk is really the importance of disaggregating data by intersectionality, thinking about context, social identity, and culture when you're diagnosing depression the importance of really trying to capture more of the cultural baggage that people are bringing in their embodiment of symptoms. Because if not, we are at risk of in that interpretation that we do is also a social construction being lost in translation. The other next point that I wanna emphasize is the need to account for the unique context of immigrant populations in how acculturation is gonna impact their depression and how they will express it. And here it's extremely important to think about how people express that depression, what terminology they use and how you as a clinician use their same terminology and try to understand how is that related to their depression and how acculturation based on where they live, how they interact, their air, uh, everyday routines, their norms, their expectations are influenced that depression. Finally, the importance of establishing validity in the data measures that we use, because many times we take off the shelves measures that are configured for middle-class white populations, but really don't have the same significant or meaning for our immigrant, non-English speakers or non-US born populations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Alegria. And now we are going to be taking questions from our audience here today. And I can see based on the breadth of these questions, how engaged everyone has been with these topics and all of your talks. So first, a question for Dr. Silverswide. Um, we know that there are uh, changes in the brain when we meditate. Can you expand on some of the recent research on functional neuroimaging and what our brains look like when we are meditating? Sure, there have been lots of studies by now and they, uh, they study or these studies are people within certain traditions and with secular meditation with mindful-based cognitive therapy uh, and the like. Uh, with disease, without disease, um, looking at people when they start to meditate and then their brains again eight weeks later, looking at monks who have meditated for more than 10,000 hours, etc. As one looks at all these studies, a few um, principles and patterns emerge. What one is doing at first is engaging the top-down prefrontal areas of the brain in metacognition and increased control of your mental activity, allocation of attention, 
um, and, uh, and attention in a top-down way to thoughts and emotions and sensations. There are other types of medit, but with practice, interestingly, experienced meditators have decreased frontal, prefrontal activity because it becomes automatic for them and internalized and it becomes subcorticalized, which is fascinating. People who uh, meditate a lot have decreased reactivity in, uh, in association with that in the limbic areas like the amygdala. They have uh, people who do body awareness and breathing exercises have uh, engagement of areas such as the insula, which has a sensory representation of our bodily uh, state or interoceptive state. People who do compassion meditation, which is another version, have more sort of frontal polar um, and related activity uh, and increased activity in some of the reward uh, and empathy systems of the brain. And so, um, and then there's open monitoring, which is letting just thoughts arise and float away. Uh, and that shows changes within the, the anterior cingulate and the, the attentional uh, system as well. So um, the first thing to realize is that meditation or mindfulness is not one thing. There's lots of different kinds, each of which engages different brain functions and regions and systems. And, but in, uh, in some, what you're doing is you're training your brain first effortfully and then automatically um, to not be so reactive and to be more aware uh, of your internal states and your external states while decoupling in terms of these networks, these salience and uh, default networks, et cetera, uh, from representations of self and uh, and high emotion. Thank you for clarifying that. Let's loop in Dr. Okereke here. Dr. Okereke, what are the types of psychosocial support that affect the epigenetics of depression? Sure. So um, in our study, for example, we used a measure of psychosocial support um, called the Duke, Psycho the Duke Social Support Index. Um, and that was the measure that we found was um, strongly inversely uh, correlated with our measure of epigenetic aging. Um, so that we saw significantly slower epigenetic aging, reduced uh, epigenetic aging in the individuals who had higher social support. So what a scale like that does is it breaks down psychosocial support based on, for example, um, social ties, so number of um, social connections, as well as the um, uh, perception of the quality of the social connection. And what's important here um, is that we, we do know that there are many different types of social connections that make up social support. It could be with immediate family members, spouse, children, friends. There could also be broader social connections in the community. Um, and so you kind of aggregate all of these things together. Um, um, and so the, the nice thing about um, measuring psychosocial support in this way is that you're pulling together the diversity of all the different kinds of social ties and forms of social support that people experience. So you, you're sort of pulling together number, quality, frequency, all those kinds of things together. Um, and that's kind of what makes up the scale. And then we have a scalar that we can compare to something like, you know, an epigenetic aging metric. Um, so, so that's a, a good way of kind of understanding those kinds of psychosocial support. The key thing that's important is that um, we don't necessarily um, look at it in a scale that any one source of social support is intrinsically better, um, as it were, than another, but really looking at overall how, how much psychosocial support does an individual have. The message is very important with that. Because with aging, we know, and, and Dr. Fuccioni referred to this, there can be many losses, such as a loss of a spouse. That can be a huge one. Um, and so the fact that you can also look, as we did, and our cohort was entirely older people. Um, the average age was 65. Many of these folks were into their 80s and 90s. Um, uh, one was actually, um, you know, there were some folks who were close to, close to 100. Um, but so we know that there are a lot of people who may, by that time, experience the loss of certain really key sources of social support. Um, but if they make up the sort of uh, larger universe of social support that comes from 
other connections, they still have that high social support score that's related to slower epigenetic aging. That's really fascinating. Thank you. And Dr. Frischone, you know, it's said that depression represents a broad range of conditions that are really grouped as one. Are those differences and types of depression, do they manifest differently in the heart? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, uh, I, th I think that it's mostly um, going to signify um, um, variants at the brain level. Um, I one of, one of the things that, that um, uh, Dr. Samuels points out is that um, um, when you have right hemispheric dominance, um, uh, your sympathetic nervous system, because it seems like the right amygdala, for example, is, is really um, tremendously focused on what um, um, some neurologists call anomaly detection. Uh, and when there's something that's out of place, our brain takes notice because it represents a big time threat. And so if you have people, for example, who have um, adverse childhood experiences, you can expect that the right um, hemisphere in, 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 right, uh, in left dominant, dominant um, individuals is really gonna be hypervigilant to change. And so in, in that case, um, that, that cascade that I pointed out, amygdala activation, um, which um, gets, um, um, you know, really uh, is very high compared to what your medial prefrontal cortex can do to inhibit amygdala activation, will lead downstream to, um, um, I think, uh, accelerated changes at the cardiac level. Um, so there you have a, a scenario where someone is bringing to adult life a lot of trauma. And this is why we're, you know, trauma-informed care is so important. Um, uh, and their cardiac um, um, profile is going to reflect that uh, because of this, this tremendously important cascade from that medial prefrontal cortex, interior cingulate, anterior insula, and speaking to a uh, hypercharged, hypervigilant right amygdala. Um, and so, you know, uh, in terms of uh, depression, uh, uh, our patients who have, uh, um, uh, have been victims of trauma, um, we know that those depressions are very hard to treat. And oftentimes they become nested in personality uh, uh, um, um, traits uh, that we find very hard to treat. That may be different from the patient with uh, a pure endogenous major depressive disorder um, and the cardiac uh, downstream effects of that kind of um, chronic stress related uh, um, uh, major depressive disorder. But it's a, it's a very interesting question, and I'm not sure it's been in studied well enough. You know, if there's one thing I think all of you are highlighting, it's the importance of the mind-body approach and how key it is for all of us to be collaborating um, with medical specialists. Um, and Dr. Alegria, you know, how does separation attachment differ across cultures? Can you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. How does that affect our understanding of depression? Yeah, I think this is uh, also a wonderful question. Uh, I think what we are seeing is uh, different, you know, different expressions uh, in terms of what is the expectation of attachment in different families. For example, we see uh, a good example of this in Jewish families with a lot of attachment, kissing, mm -hmm. hugging, um, doing, uh, you know, expressions of uh caring and love very uh, explicitly. We see other cultures where the attachment in terms of how you express your emotions, including, you know, I would say um, certain populations in the US is much distance. The attachment across all populations, I would say is very, very important, but how you interpret that uh, attachment is really the value here because 
you could not have parents, uh, for example, that uh, are hugging and kissing. But if that's the expectation of how you would relate in terms of your attachment with your child, that's still, you know, consider from the interpretation of the child that you are having an attachment. I think the best example of this was um, when uh, a plane uh, crash actually in Massachusetts, very near when September 11, the Dominican families were crying and screaming and in the, when they, had, they were interviewing them on the, in the, in the TV and some of the uh, families of more, uh, what would be US born uh, people were more restrained, didn't show a lot of, you know, crying, whatever. And it was interesting hearing, you know, uh, the people from other countries saying what's happening. Did they love their people there that they're, you know, so restrained in their um, feelings for this people dying? So we do very much interpretations based on our uh, cultural background. Uh, all of this is socially constructed. And for all of you, we actually have a question that would be applicable to every expert here. Uh, what do you see as the new language of depression from your lens of expertise as we move forward? Can we start with Dr. O'Karaki? Um, in terms of the new language, just to clarify, <laughs> the new language of depression, um, uh, could you say a little bit more about uh, what you mean by sort of getting at a new language of depression? I think that this particular question from this audience member is probably asking about, you know, the framework for depression from your perspective. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if sure. I can. Sure. Well, I hope I answered the question that was intended. Um, but in terms of um, it's from a about... personalized medicine perspective. Oh, okay, great, super. Um, yeah. Well, I think that that's a theme that that comes up um, very often. Is um, can we think about depression differently? Um, so, in in terms of the um, the kinds of approaches that I described in my presentation, I think they point out how we can look at the underpinnings of depression um, from a systems perspective. So a lot of the, um, the metrics that I was referring to, you know, epigenetics is one, but they all kind of relate to some of those other ohms I alluded to, metabolomics, proteomics, transcriptomics, that kind of give you a language of understanding um, the full systems biology piece that underlies um, what drives depression. Um, and so it may allow us to articulate a new language of depression, in which, for example, in the future, you could sort of see uh, a metabolomic or proteomic um, signature or imprint of depression that is personalized. And then the treatment then becomes personalizable because you can move up or down um, as needed uh, the readout that you're getting of this biological signature, which is informed by systems biology approaches and omics. So that's one perspective I have on this idea of personalization and depression. Fantastic. And Dr. Silverswipe would love to hear from you on this topic. I uh, so enjoyed, as I always do, hearing my distinguished colleagues speak and uh, want to congratulate you, Dr. Nakarni, for putting together this session and this panel and this opportunity. And I think what it represents, the panel itself and each of us in our own ways from our own disciplines have talked to this, is that we're in an era now that transcends the old dichotomy between mind and brain, between biologic and uh, environmental experiential, uh, nature and nurture, so to speak. And each of us has been speaking to the intersectionality of the ways in which we all as uh, people, as organisms come into the world, into situations, into societies with certain risk and resilience factors biologically, programmed, genetically programmed, neurodevelopmentally and psychologically developmentally unfolding. And then things happen to us for good or ill uh, and their sociocultural context, uh, et cetera. And, um, and the, the brain evolved in order to mediate the interactions with the environment. And so we're in an era where it's just as important to understand the sorts of things 
that uh, Dr. Okariki and Dr. Alegria were saying, and uh, as what I was saying, we're all saying the same thing. And Dr. Frischione, you know, brought it together beautifully uh, in terms of where the rubber meets the road. So, um, so I would say, you know, the new language is it, we're we're now starting to speak the same language, um, and really that language is how the, all of these complex factors, biologically and environmentally, come together to um, affect the way a person feels and, uh, and when it crosses the threshold into depression and then what we can do about it. What would you add to that, Dr. Frischoni? Well, I think that that's a great answer that, that David get, gave. I think uh, one way to also look at it, again, from the evolutionary point of view, there, there are certain universals that we share as a species and um, uh, you know, I think Bowlby said it best, man's environment of evolutionary adaptedness is always gonna be secure base attachment. Um, our first anxiety is separation anxiety, right? Uh, and it kind of never goes away. Uh, and so that's a universal because we're all part of the same species, but then the particulars enter into the, into the um, uh, assessment. And that's something we call personalized medicine. Um, so, and, and um, Maggie is really speaking to that um, in terms of all of the different cultures and how um, the social construct um, has grown up over the eons to deal with that universal challenge we face as a species. And um, that then has an impact on uh, the phenotype of depression um, uh, that, that emerges. Um, and, so that, that um, variance and invariance that Maggie was talking about will show up in our psychometrics, um, perhaps because of that. And of course, that, I, I, as, as Olivia um, 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 you know, explicated in her talk, and as David mentioned, you know, the epigenetics is this remarkable whole new branch of medicine that has, uh, you know, I remember reading books about the difference between heredity and environment and the debate of nature and nurture. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we have th this amazing science that says, oh, forget about that, throw those books away. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's a remarkable time to be looking uh, at the, the neuropsychiatry of our conditions. I must say, and I'd be interested in, in getting David's impression, but I, I was so impressed with a, a paper um, by Goodkind of thinking about this voxel-based mor mor uh, morphometry core. And all of us have been speaking to that core and all the this, this six major psychiatric disorders. When you do a meta-analysis of BBM, that's where the, you know, the action is in the anterior cingulate and the anterior insula. And so it's screaming to us that, that this, is, this is so important for, for all of uh, what we're trying to do, uh, depression included. Yeah, I can quickly say to that, that um, Marcel Mezalam, who both you and I revere, Greg, yes. um, you know, talked about this in, in his classic book, uh, and behavioral neuroanatomy, uh, the, <clears throat> that the paralimbic regions, the anterior cingulate and the anterior insula being two primary nodes of which, um, are the intermediate between the more primitive emotional limbic system that we started talking right. about and the higher order neocognitive system that we started talking about. Right. It's where the rubber meets the road. It's where the modulation happens bi-directionally and it's where, as he said, the internal environment meets the external environment and the changing needs and demands all the time of those. So it's not surprising that in one psychiatric disorder after another and in different ways with different profiles, um, it's, it's that interface uh, that characterizes these uh, disorders and causes so much suffering. Yeah. Yep. And Dr. Alegria, I would love to hear your perspective on this, but we have so many questions for you. <laughs> and, um, so I, I, I just want to say one thing that I yeah. think that the narrative is also changing, and uh, as you were saying, because structural vulnerabilities, <clears throat> structural vulnerabilities in people's housing, neighborhood environment, air, 
uh, ability to socialize uh, are all also such a powerful part. And now we know that not taking them into account is what I think is also having this big effect of we're not moving the needle in depression. So I hope we move more to thinking not only about the importance of epigenetics, which I completely agree, but also of the environment in which we're living and the sociostructural vulnerabilities that people face that lead them to depression. So I just think that's such a wonderful point. I, I wanted to piggyback on what um, Dr. Alegria said, which is that I, I may have underplayed um, uh, uh, some of the value of um, you know, what I think Greg was sort of beginning to hint at with epigenetics, which is that it is precisely this which makes it so valuable. Unlike our sort of nuclear genome, which is that you know, her inherited DNA, with the epigenome, we're seeing changes that accrue across a lifetime. And some of the most important exposures that we're looking at are things like air, ambient air pollution, proximity to road, you know, right. greenness, right. <laughs> socialization, structural determinants and social determinants okay. of health. They have direct inputs on the epigenetic readouts. So it's a, it's a wonderful way to pull together these important factors that Dr. Allegria is referring to in terms of understanding the, the direct contribution mechanistically of these factors to depression and depression risk. So we have so many questions to choose from, but I don't think it's possible to hold a conference at this time without finding at all of your perspectives on what we've learned about depression since COVID. And to start us off, can you tell us more about that, Dr. Prashoni? Well, um, you know, one of the challenges that COVID presented uh, was this, this um, entwining of our kind of ancient um, uh, innate immune response uh, to microbial threats and uh, the, what we've been talking about in terms of our mammalian heritage and our need for social uh, attachment. Uh, and, you know, so this kind of plague, um, um, one, of, one of the strategies was to separate us, right? from other people because of the, the viral contagion. Um, and uh, it makes sense in terms of that ancient um, um, uh, microbial threat um, uh, to us as organisms, but it also separated us from our survival strategy, which was of, of social support. And um, that, it, it, you know, it, uh, in Olivia's talk, you heard about the importance of low perceived social support in cardiac disease, but it's true for all stress related non communicable diseases. Uh, and um, so we were robbed of our main strategy with dealing with stress. And of course, the threat of a viral contagion is very stressful to us. So it, 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 it brought to mind, well, I'm sure the same thing happened in 1918, that this is a perfect storm for us as, as human beings, as something like this. And then now we're seeing, you know, uh, so much, so much anxiety and depression and the need for care is, has skyrocketed. I think that that's a downstream effect of, of this, this challenge. And then kids, poor kids, you know, um, in their developmental stage, um, school uh, performs such an important function for socialization and development. And now going back to school um, after being away for two years, it's, it's a big, big challenge. And so child psychiatrists and psychologists are just overwhelmed. Um, um, so I think we can understand it. The problem is, is and this gets back to what uh, Dr. Patel was talking about, how do you get to all the people who need uh, mm -hmm. um, care? Um, so. And Dr. Silverswai, give us the neuropsychiatrist perspective. Um, I, uh, I agree, you know, with what Dr. Frischion was saying. I think there've also been, uh, unfortunately, experiments of nature that show us the direct ways in which the virus and or the immune response interacts with the brain uh, and produces in some people above and beyond the psychosocial stress that Greg so eloquently described. 
um, an increased incidence in vulnerable people uh, because of the effect on these regions and circuits. And in fact, it's often additive, right? Um, it's the, and that's the double whammy that, that we're all talking about too, whether uh, at, at all of our different levels is uh, a vulnerability or a risk combined with a, uh, you know, a mediator or moderator. And then before you know it, you know, your the system is tipped over. And at the end of the day, systems are all about, um, you know, homeostasis, right? And coming back to, or as Bruce McEwen, my colleague, uh, dear departed, uh, you know, really talked about is allostasis, uh, the way in which the stress burden uh, across one's lifetime uh, affects one. And, and Olivia, you know, talked about some of the mechanisms whereby this can, can be transduced. Um, and, you know, uh, coming full circle evolutionarily, uh, including the social uh, elements that Maggie was talking about that are so important. Um, you know, how do we, uh, how do we keep our equilibrium, right? Um, as, as, as systems, as human beings and not be perturbed in this stressful, traumatic world. Um, and, um, and this is where a conference like this and, and a center like the Osher Center that focuses in a very broad holistic way uh, on things that can help people um, is, is very vital. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank our experts for this really wonderful discussion. And